are starting a new series called Breaking Addiction. This is quite a serious uh, series, so the comedy level might not be as high uh, unless we're talking about ourselves, but um, this is a, quite a serious topic. It really is. It, we have seen as uh, pastors, as a church, we have seen quite a lot of things come to the surface. We've had more counseling requests than ever before, um, and I don't know that it's just that people went into addictions just, you know, off the, you know, just, just off the cuff and just jumped into them, but maybe it's because things have been revealed and been coming to the surface more because of what's happened over the last couple of years with lockdown, with pandemic, and all these different types of things. Now, if this is your first time, a very special welcome to you. We're so glad you are here with us, and you might have noticed we like to get into maybe difficult topics, and we'd rather do that because Jesus said he's come to give us life and life to the full. Well, we've got to try and take hold of that and grasp onto that as well, as much as we can. So today, this addiction series, we are actually going to be going over four different topics from today and on to the next few weeks as well. This today is going to be about admitting your addictions. The following week will be why we become addicted. And then week three, we'll be talking about the tools to actually overcome addiction. And then the last week is living addiction free. Living addiction free. It's important to know how to live addiction free because it's one thing to try and get rid of it, but then maybe it comes back again. How do you actually stay in this life where you don't have this, 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 this like the voice in your head that keeps tempting you to go back? How do you live truly in that freedom? I want you to please know as well, that we really do take this uh, seriously. We're not trying to offer platitudes of just pray, get over it, here's a few scriptures, everything will be sorted out. No, this is not, this is not, I'm not trying to present myself as an expert, but I want us to be a part of the solution of what is the next steps to overcome these things because I believe that they're real issues in our lives. In fact, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Becoming Unstuck, Becoming Unstuck. And Becoming Unstuck, you can actually get it online um, at Amazon if you're watching us uh, right now and you're not here. But if you're in the room right now, I have a whole box of these. I'd love to give you a copy of this uh, as my gift to you. This is something that God has really shown me quite significantly about how we often become frozenly, uh, fro uh, emotionally frozen in our lives and we just become stuck. You can become wealthy, you can become successful, you can have great marriage, you can have all these wonderful things in your life, but you're actually still stuck in your life because there's things from your past that you have not been able to disconnect yourself to. So that's my gift to you if you'd like to take a copy of that. It's called Becoming Unstuck. What is addiction? I'm going to offer a few um, academic responses right now to this topic before I get into what I think the Bible says about that. The first question we have is, what is addiction? Well, addiction, according to one definition, is a persistent use of a drug despite substantial harm and adverse consequences. Now, that drug, does, that drug doesn't actually have to just be an opiate. It can be a drug of even gambling, which actually does affect your brain as well. The characteristics of addiction are compulsive engagement in rewarding stimuli, preoccupation with substances or behavior, a need for immediate gratification, and a downplaying of harmful effects. Har downplaying of harmful effects, in another word, is called being in denial. Denial isn't just a river in Egypt. It is a, it's, a, it's a place that we actually live in sometimes where we downplay the things that seem to affect us. Examples of this could be opioids, alcoholism, food, overeating, work or workaholism. That's probably one of the, the things that I wrestle with myself. That if, I haven't, if I don't feel like I've worked hard enough and I haven't done enough, I get antsy and I get unsettled and I can't be at rest and I've had to train myself to be at rest and to stop working all the time. It's workaholism because what it does is it tries to calm something else within myself, which is truly just an issue of inadequacy within myself. And so we can give ourselves to too much uh, working. Or what about cutting? Cutting is a big thing that's been growing quite significantly with young people. Gambling, gaming, online gaming, pornography. And another big one that's happened in the last 10 years is social media. You think, surely no one's addicted to social media. Yes, it actually is quite a common thing with people. It does actually give you the ability to get a hit off of it. It gives you a change of your brain waves where you get this high within yourself. 
The roots is usually a combination. The roots of, of addiction can be a combination of the psychological, the spiritual, the biological, or the sociological. For example, if you take alcoholism, where I've got someone in my family who just cannot admit that they have an issue with alcohol. Um, no one over here, it's actually in Scotland, so stop guessing who that is, all right? <laughs> It can actually be, oh, which one is it? I knew it was them. I always knew it was them. And, uh, <laughs> and it can actually be a biological thing, right? So, so we've now found out that some people do have DNA that has a propensity towards alcoholism. We have found that. But what would be easy is to say, well, it's a biological thing, so let's just give medication to it and that will fix the problem. Well, I actually think it's more than just a medication thing. It's more than just a biological thing. I think it's also a sociological thing. In Scotland, we have a huge culture of drinking in Scotland. It's a really big thing in Scotland. I mean, it's, it's in fact, the, the word word whiskey means water of life. I mean, talk about dysfunctional, right? And, 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 and even in Scotland, they have now banned all drinking and driving at all. I mean, you cannot have one glass of wine or half a beer or something. You cannot do it because it's gotten so bad. It's also a psychological thing where uh, the, psych, the psychology of alcoholism can be that it, it, if you're born into a family where this is what you've only seen in your family, then it can become a very psychological thing that that's the way you think you should live your life. But the last route is actually also a spiritual thing. Now, if you read scripture, especially if you read Old Testament, it uses a word called stronghold. And a stronghold is something that is a spiritual strength, a spiritual. Uh, um, um, place in your life that you cannot overcome. It's like a city with a wall all the way around it and you can't knock it down. It has a stronghold in your life. That's the combination of these roots um, of, of addiction that often are, are explain why we're in these addictions. And these are the, the different areas we actually have to tackle. Some examples that we can think of even from Scripture. There are many people in Scripture that, that actually showed the behaviors of addiction and maybe they don't say addiction, maybe they only show showed once or twice, but, but we can actually extrapolate that actually this may have actually been a behavior in their life. Like Noah, Noah actually saw this. He was, he was tasked with building a boat and he was tasked with bringing all these animals in. And then the rest of the earth was going to be wiped out. And that's how God was actually going to start all over again. And the first thing that he did when he got off the boat was he went and found a vine and he planted a vine, made it grow up so that he could get to alcohol. That's the first thing he did. Now, I get it. I don't have a blame for him. He thought, imagine Jesus, imagine God picking Noah. Could he not have found a better guy to do this? But the trauma that Noah must have gone through to carry that type of burden in his life, and the first thing he wanted to do was get off that boat and get drunk. Woo! What about Abraham? Abraham had a propensity for lying couldn't stop lying, even though he had met God face to face and God had promised him all the things that were gonna happen in his life and he couldn't trust God enough. There was a disconnect with him and he had a propensity for lying. What about Solomon? The wisest man it's considered in the Old Testament. 300 wise and 700 concubines. Talk about a dumb person, <laughs> right? How many wives can you cope with? One, that's all I can do. You talk, amen, yeah. Too much for me. But imagine he had to have this. I can only imagine he probably had a sex addiction. You can't tackle just one root when it comes to addiction. You can't just tackle one thing. If I try and discipline myself, that will fix everything. No. If I just try and get counseling, that'll just be enough. No. All parts must be addressed. The psychological, the biological, the sociological, and the spiritual. Statistics tell us this, that patients that go into rehab are very likely to relapse. Now think about it, if they've gone into rehab and they've been able to change their behavior, they've been able to modify what they're doing, they've got all the counseling, they've been in, they've been in rehab for a very long time, why would they go back? The reason is this, is that it's not just a physical thing, it's not just a neurological thing, it's not just a sociological disorder. They return because they still want the effects it tells us that there's something deeper missing within us. That even though we have been able to conquer these addictions, we still want something that, that the addictions give us. So why is addiction a thing that we turn to? I wanna suggest two things. The first one is this. It's an escape from pain. It's always an escape from pain. And the other one is, it's an experience of peace. If you've had a traumatic upbringing or you've had a disconnect in your family or in your emotions, 
then it's normal that you actually want to stop feeling that pain. Or even if you've gone through deep grief, you want to try and run away from this pain. It makes a lot of sense that we want to get rid of this. Maybe it's personal failure. Maybe it's emotions of rejection. But what we really desire is an experience of peace. And what I want to suggest to you is that this is more than just an experience that you've had in your childhood. I believe it goes to the core of our being because if you believe with what Scripture says, with what happened in Adam and Eve and with the Garden of Eden, they were thrown out of the place of peace because God couldn't trust them anymore. So there is a longing within us to have a restoration of relationship with God, a restoration of that peace, and that safety with God, and we're all wrestling with that until we return back to his arms. And so while we're on this earth, we are trying to battle this disconnect that we have with God. Essentially, addiction is an issue of bonding. It's always an issue of bonding. Bonding maybe with your parents, bonding maybe with God, Bonding maybe just within yourself that you don't know how to feel love. A man, an author said, Yuhani Hari said, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Because there's a disconnect within us. Years ago when I, uh, I, 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 we had a, a family in our church and the gentleman had brought his brother in to come and see me and he said, you, you, would you speak with my brother? And I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. And so I sat down, I was chatting with him and he was telling me, he just said, what are you doing here? And he's like, because my brother dragged me here. <clears throat> I said, yeah, but why did he drag you here? And he goes, well, it's probably because my, my wife is leaving me. And he was dressed, you know, in biker gear and he was a big tough guy. And I said, why do you think she's leaving you? And he goes, oh, I know, it's because I'm addicted to porn. And I said, why do you think you're addicted to porn? And he goes, I don't know. And then his brother says, well, why don't you tell him why you've lost all your other four marriages? And I said, this is your fifth marriage. And he said, yes. I said, do you see a pattern going on in your life? And he goes, maybe. And I said, well, tell me about your mother and tell me about your father. So we started talking about his mother and his father. And he lost his mother when he was eight years old to cancer. And I said, bro, you just want the bosom of your mother. It's not porn you want. You want this. You want the comfort of your mother. And this big burly man just started to sob. There's a disconnect in our relationships with each other. There's a disconnect of our bonding. And God has designed us to need a bonding with each other. And when we don't have that, we need to numb that feeling of rejection and give ourselves a feeling of a high, an upper or a downer. They can go, can go either way. So, What are the first steps of breaking addiction? How do we deal with those past issues of broken bonds? Well, in the coming weeks, we hope to really start discovering that. But I want to give us the first steps of what I think that we need to consider in order to go down this path because it's a journey to be free from these strongholds. And the first one is this, admit your addictions. The first step of 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, as you probably have heard before, is admitting that you can't control your addiction. Dr. Phil McGraw from the, the famous TV show says, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. If you can't acknowledge it, then you're never gonna be able to tackle it, right? It's the first step. Even the apostle Paul did this. He had to do it. He said in Romans 7, 15 to 19, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. That's an admission. I can't handle this, this, this junk that's in my life. I can't overcome this by myself. Admitting it is the first step. The second step out of three is this, is to confess your sin. James 5, 16 says this, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James equates, this is one of the the, the disciples, one of the apostles, he equates healing with confession of your sins. Now, it might not actually just be your sins. It might even be the sins that have, been ha- that have happened in your past towards yourself, also as well as your own sins. But when you go through confession, you're likely to get to a place of healing. Now, let me tell you the difference between confession and admission. Confession is with remorse. It's when you're sorry enough to change. Admission is often reluctant acceptance 
It does not require any remorse whatsoever. Maybe you've admitted what your problem is, but maybe it's because you got caught. Just the other day, just last week, one, a 65-year-old politician in Britain just got caught watching pornography in the middle of session, in the middle of parliament, and he got complained against him. And you think, he's 65 years old, and they asked him, why did you do it? And he goes, I don't know. It's a moment of madness. I just, I don't, I don't know why I did it. I know why, because it's a stronghold in your life that has overcome you. Now he's admitted to it, but it doesn't mean he's confessed it, right? He's, you know, I did confess it. No, you were caught in the middle of it. This is why confession is completely different. Confession should be something that's specific. What is it that you're confessing about? It's very easy, Father, just forgive me for my sins. It's very easy to be general and vague. But let me tell you, when you get specific about these things, it gives you the ability to remove its power in your life. You follow me so far? Proverbs 28, 13 says this, Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Mercy is when you're given relief. You're given freedom when you don't actually deserve it. When I was um, a young father, my, uh, my, my son was about three years old and I got up in the morning and I couldn't find him in the house. And of course, I'm going in a panic and I find the front door open. I'm like, what the heck? So I run outside and I'm like, Kale, where are you? Kale, Kale, where are you? And I couldn't find him. Now, it felt like an eternity. Maybe it was only five minutes. I couldn't find them. So I jumped over the fence to the field behind us and I was running around the field. And I'm like, maybe something's happened to him. He's only three years old. And then I'm running into each other, people's other yards and I'm screaming, Kale, where are you? And I suddenly get into this panic thinking maybe he's been stolen. Maybe someone has taken him away. And I had just such, it's one of the worst things I'd, I'd experienced. You know, and, and I finally found him hiding behind the air conditioning unit and he could have heard me, right? And I took him by the arm and I'd marched him in. I'm like, why didn't you? answer me? Why did you run away? Why did you do this? I can't berate, not one of my best parenting moments, I'll be honest, but I was in such a panic and I was just like berating him to some degree. And, and he just went, his, his, his eyes welled up and he just went, because, because I did. And that's all he said. And it wasn't an explanation, but it was a confession. You see, the thing is with addiction is you can't necessarily explain it. All you can do is confess it. Addiction is really hard to explain. When he said it, I felt like this is exactly what I would say to God myself. Because if he was gonna ask me what I should do, I would say, I don't know what I should do. I don't know why I'm doing it. All I can say is, yes, I did it. This is what confession is. Criminals even report being relieved when they confess because a weight is lifted off their shoulders. What weight is this? Why is it that weight is removed? Because it's all to do with this third thing, which is your conscience, your conscience. Confession is the key that opens the door to your conscience. And your conscience is something that is more important than you realize in your life. Let's talk about clearing your conscience. When you clear your conscience, your, your, the, your conscience is an inner barometer for your morality. This is not about having a good conscience because you can't have a good conscience. You can only have a clear conscience. Let me show you three ways that conscience works. The first one is this. Your conscience works negatively. Now you might think, no, 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 I have a good conscience. No, you have good behaviors. You have a good attitude but you can't have a good conscience. You can only have a clear conscience. A conscience is like that little light on your dashboard that says, check engine, right? And you have a decision to make. Am I gonna check my engine or am I not, right? You're gonna go, should I? No, I'll be fine. I'll just keep driving. And you overlook this little light that tells you something's up with your engine and you keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until you're in a place where it's so screwed up, your car's broken down and you should have paid attention to that light. That's what your conscience is. You don't have a special thumbs up every morning going, engine's good, you're looking good. Well done, buddy. It's not falling apart. There's no, there's no light on your dashboard for that. The check engine light is all about a negative matter that's going on. You know whether you should go and watch that movie or whether you shouldn't watch that movie, but it's your conscience that convicts you after you watch the movie and go, I shouldn't have done it, right? Maybe I shouldn't go to the beach because there's too many people with their clothes on and I have a problem with lusting, right? I already know that. It'll be fine. I'll just go there. Then you get there and you go, I feel so bad. 
That's what your conscience is. Maybe you shouldn't go to Las Vegas for a vacation if you have a problem with gambling. Maybe you shouldn't go to the bar for lunch if you have a problem with alcohol. There's no such thing as a good conscience, only a clear conscience. And clear conscience comes with the second thing. It works retrospectively. It works retrospectively. Like I say, there's no thumbs up on the dashboard for how well you've done. It tells you what has happened, not what is going to happen. What tells you what is going to happen? I'll tell you what tells you what's going to happen. God tells you what's going to happen, right? God told Adam and Eve, don't touch this tree, don't eat of this fruit, you'll be fine. Now they had no conscience, they had no concept of what good or bad was, sorry, they had no concept of what sin was. They knew what good was because they knew that God was good. But as soon as they did what was wrong, then it affected their conscience. The way that we save ourselves from going into problems is by acting in obedience. Obedience is needed to know what is good to choose. It's when we trust God that when he says don't do this, we trust him whether we know or understand exactly what that means. We can't know everything that is good and we can't know everything that is bad. That's why we need a bond and a connection with God and we trust him by obeying him. Adam and Eve only had a conscience after they fell and sinned. When they fell, they felt guilt and shame after it. In Genesis 3, 7, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. Why naked? They were already naked. It's not like suddenly, where's all my clothes gone? Just disappeared. They were already naked. Let me tell you what they were covered by. They were covered by the protection of God. They were covered by the glory of God. They were covered by the innocence of God. But as soon as they disobeyed God, they became aware of their conscience. They were self-conscious. They became naked. The bond with God was broken. The third way that your conscience works is this. It works progressively. It works progressively. That means it either gets better or it gets worse. It's never stationary. Now, it could actually have been set by your parents. We're always dependent on our parents to set our conscience. It could be set by your culture, it could be set by your friends, or it can actually be set by God. Your conscience is not always super reliable because it can be very influenced by your culture. Like my father, when he grew up, uh, when he was a child and the church that he grew up in, in those days, you weren't allowed to ride your bike because that was considered work and you're not allowed to work on a Sunday, right? Then he got older and he's like, that's not what it means, but his conscience convicted him when he was young because of the culture that he came from. So it's possible for your culture to have an effect on you, but our job is to figure out how do we get our conscience to become aligned with God? How do we get our conscience to become aligned with God? Well, when you're aligned with God and you align your conscience with Him, it gives you three different things. The first one is this, it gives you healing. As James said in a proverb says, it gives you healing. And the healing that we need is a new bond with God. The second thing it gives us is sensitivity. Sensitivity is really important. I've got a very good friend who just went through, going through a whole new thing of confession in his life. And he, was, he said, you know, I was more addicted to medication and to drugs and to alcohol than I realized. And he said, but now that I have confessed it and I'm see, getting healing in my life and I'm really seeing myself being sober and I'm being free of this stuff, it's absolutely wonderful. He said, but now the problem is this, I'm starting to see all the other things that I didn't see that I used to do. For instance, I've had to apologize to my wife because I just haven't been a good husband for the last 10 years. I've had to apologize to my, my children because I haven't been fully there and engaged with them for so long. When you become more aligned with God, you become much more sensitive in your spirit, you become more sensitive in your conscience. And the last thing is this, it gives you power over temptation. When your conscience is clear, you can talk about anything that you have done. But when your conscience isn't clear, you can't talk about the stuff. You feel too guilty and you you feel too shamed that this thing still has power over you. But when God, when you find this freedom in God and this forgiveness of God, your conscience becomes clear. You wanna tell the world, I overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of my testimony. Look what God has done in my life. I don't care if people know what I used to be because that's no longer who I am. God has cleared my conscience. When you're giving and receiving forgiveness, your conscience becomes clear. True power to overcome addiction comes from God. Before you can understand addiction or get the tools to overcome it, you're gonna have to get right with God. You have to confess your sin and clear your conscience. This coming week, 
We're going to have some small groups. I know this is not small group semester week, but some of you still go to small groups. And if you're not in a small group, I want you to consider calling someone up and telling them about maybe some of the things that you're wrestling. And just be honest. Be as honest as possible to confess the things that have some level of control or power in your life. Because if you don't get honest with it, you'll find that you won't find the power that you need to overcome this thing. In fact, as a church, what we've done is we've made a website page and you can take this QR code or you can go to the website, northwestorlando.com forward slash recovery dash resources, recovery dash resources. And there is small groups on there. There are counselors you can, uh, you can contact, not just in our church, but even outside the churches, resources even outside the church. If you don't really want to do it through our church, that's fine. But we have to take the next steps to say, I need to be done with this thing. This is too much of a habit, too much of a pattern in my life, and I need to be done with this thing. I need to be done with this, this addiction to sexuality, this addiction to alcohol, to shopping, to workaholism, to gaming, to gambling, to whatever it is that seems to consume you periodically or daily, you've got to call it quits on it at some point. And the first step is admit it. Let's stand this morning as we end our service. <clears throat> Father, this is a major topic and we're not gonna pretend like it's overcome in just one moment or one day. We see even people in the Bible who were great men and women of God that wrestled with this stuff. And we know fine well that if they wrestled this stuff, then what makes us think that we're gonna do this by ourselves? Father, we're asking for a restoration in our relationship with you. We're asking for a healing from the trauma from our past. And we're asking for the power of the cross to clear our conscience and give us the power to overcome these things that so easily beset us. Father, I pray for every person in this room that's watching online as well. I pray that you'd fill them with your spirit. Give them a peace in their heart that overcomes all understanding. Give them a peace that surpasses all understanding and help them to be free, free, free indeed. We ask this in your precious son's name. And all God's people said, amen. We love you guys.